It is a beautiful day here in Chiang Mai, Thailand, Pattaya, Thailand, and Koh Phangan, Thailand. So we're all on the same time zone. Unfortunately, it's either prime time on the West Coast at 10, 15 p.m., or it is just the middle of the night and you guys are listening on iTunes or the day after. But today we have Sylvie von Douglas Itu on the podcast. We have had her on here before after her 200th fight, and now she had it. Once again, a very exciting weekend. It wasn't a milestone when it comes to the big numbers that she's putting up on the board, but she did fight a Karchuk fight in the middle of the day, followed by a five-hour car ride up to Chiang Mai, where I'm living, and then fighting again and scoring a fourth-round TKO. So that was exciting in itself, but we're going to be going over a number of things today, including um, one of the... Moy Cow Summits that they are hosting this is the first summit of its kind. So we're going to go over a lot of topics. But first of all, how have you been? <laughs> I've been really good. Thank you. <laughs> it's, uh, it's one of these things where uh, anytime I am doing something, I'm so focused on doing that and jumping to the next thing that when I actually have to stop and like recap what I've been up to, I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> a lot of stuff going on (laughs) well you have to be in the moment especially when you're trying to focus on one thing going on to the next going on to the next i feel like your brain is occupied at all times and they're all things that are kind of critical they're things that people i guess have a milestone of doing every couple months but you're just kind of consolidating it within a span of a couple days or even within the same day yeah. And, and then you kind of have to look back on it. Do you feel like sometimes you're missing some of the the part of, I, I guess, the part to appreciate it all or to sit back and meditate on everything that just happened? Um, I don't think that I'm unaware of the things that I'm doing just because I'm so focused on it. Like, I, I am aware of how incredible these experiences are. I got to um, road trip with my all-time hero, Carhat, on this trip. So, like... It's basically like road tripping with Batman, which was like really <laughs> awesome. And I got to, I got to enjoy the moments as they're happening, as we're doing it, even though there's the like, Karaha, get in the fucking car, we have to go up to Chiang Mai. Um, but yeah, I don't think I'm, I'm missing out on it by, by being in it. But it's one of these things where like everyone has their own normal, you know, and like this is kind of my normal is to have kind of insane experiences like this pretty frequently. So when it comes to like all these experiences and being able to kind of like document them, because w- what what blows my mind is like, well, obviously what you're doing, uh, trying to set this uh, record for as many fights as you can or most fights ever by anybody. Is that what it is? <laughs> I'm tr- <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm trying to beat Len Wickwar, who uh, has 470 documented fights. So I want to do 471. He was in the yeah, 20s. So, that, so, so that's one goal. That's one, one pretty goal, large yeah. goal. And, and, and then you're also uh, simultaneously like documenting the whole entire process, which is, uh, it, at least on my side of things, it takes a lot of energy and time to be able to uh, write about my experiences, do vlogs about my experiences. But meanwhile, you're doing like 10 times or maybe even like 100 times more than I'm doing. So how are you able to uh, balance out all that kind of uh, just documenting, writing, all that mental energy with the physical energy and the mental energy that's revolved with uh, Muay Thai? Um, it's not easy, uh, for sure. It's it's a lot of work. But again, it's it's whatever your normal is. So because I do it all the time, it's like people who run ultra marathons. You're like, 100 miles? Like, who's going to run 100 miles? But they do it all the time. So for them, that's their normal. Um, I have a lot of help from my husband. He does a lot of the, like, uploading and kind of piecing things together so that um, I can just go through and voice over and write and do things like this. So having a partner in crime, my husband, Kevin, does a lot of that stuff that if I had to do it on my own, I would have, like, 40 hours in a day. <laughs> Uh, that's very helpful. And then it's just loving what I do, like having uh, having my patrons who support me and my sponsors who support me, knowing that there are people who are into the content and that they're getting things out of it and that uh, that allows me to come up with different, you know, different content and different things that I can be sharing. Um, it inspires me. So loving what I do actually makes it uh, far less stressful 
<laughs> then if I step back and look at it, like all the things that I have to do. So I'm excited about the things I'm doing pretty much all the time. So in addition to that, well, first off, like if you, it's that old saying, like, if you do what you love, you never work a day in your life kind of thing. And mm. I feel like all of us are kind of in that same uh, realm where we're all immersed in Muay Thai in one form or another. And although this is work, this is also play and fun and something that we really enjoy doing. So like you said, it's a, it's a little bit easier to uh, do everything when you're so passionate about it. And speaking of about passion, uh, another thing, another project, another goal that you have is this Muay Cow uh, seminar that you were able to set up with some of the legends of the sport. And it's a really exciting endeavor that you're on. And why don't you just talk a little bit about what it is, uh, why you're so excited about it, and how people can find out a little bit more about it as well. Yeah, so uh, just as an introduction, Muay Cao is a um, division of Muay Thai that's knee fighting. So Muay is Muay Thai and Cao is the knee. So it was probably like five years ago or something that uh, I even discovered there were styles within Muay Thai. Like I had no idea. It was basically like you either fight like San Chai or you suck. Kind of thing. So like... I was pretty excited to find these fighters who are the kings of Muay Cao and being super inspired by how forward they are, how, like, if you watch Diesel Noy, who's the king of knees, he's trying to hurt his opponent all the time. He's really exciting to watch. Um, so even just finding Muay Cao and identifying with it and being like, oh my God, these are my people was really exciting to me. And I think that that there are lots of people who do uh, graft onto that style as well. So being able to find the fighters um, who have that style, who epitomize that style, who can teach that style um, is exciting for people. And unfortunately, this style in particular, because it's so close range and it involves a lot of clinch, is really difficult for women to learn around the world because clinch in general, due to lots of different structures and gyms, can be really hard for women to learn. Um, so I'm super excited about this being an all-female uh, summit, because that means that the women who come here and learn from the legends themselves of the Muay Cao style, it's going to be women who are bringing it back to their gyms and, and um, proliferating it out to their gyms in different areas of the world. I find that really fucking cool. Um, and there's nothing like it. It's like uh, my husband keeps coming up with these ideas of things he wants to add to the summit, and we keep being able to add it, which is really incredible. But it's like, every single thing that gets added is there's never been anything else like it on top of things that it's already been never anything like it. So not only do we have uh, legends of Muay Cao coming down to teach us men from the golden age, but we also have the top female Thai fighters of Thailand of this style coming to train with us. Um, which again, for me is really exciting because when men come to Thailand, gyms are mostly men. So you get to train with other men and kind of have this fraternity. Um, women are often isolated in gyms, so there aren't very many of us, and especially Western women don't go to gyms that have Thai women. Um, so we don't get to train with Thai women, we just get to fight them. Uh, so the opportunity to actually train with these super hardcore women, I fangirl out so hard every time I see Sao Sing train. Um, she's coming. I'm really excited for the women of the summit to have this opportunity. Um, and the live stream is open to everybody. So uh, you can go get that at, uh, we'll put a link to that, but um, it's bit.ly join the summit and you can watch the live stream. You can interact. We're going to have it hosted. So you can ask questions while it's happening. And then I'll do my classic voiceover and we'll have like something that you can get at the end. That's more edited and, and put together as well. Um, but men can do that one. <laughs> It's all women in the summit, but men can be on that one. That's a ton of work that you guys are putting in there, especially with the list of names that Kevin provided. Me and him have been kind of chatting in the background. But in addition to this, I just wanted to kind of take a step back and go back to the beginning of how do you make all of this sexy to the Western public, to <laughs> the people that are – uh, you know, interested in because to the people that have gotten, let's say, to to the level that you have, or people like myself that really, really do enjoy the clinch. For me, I think it's more of like an aesthetic and build kind of thing because you know it kind of fits my body type, so that's why I love it because it's easier for me. But yeah, there, you and there I are have so the many... same body type. <laughs> <laughs> Just jack shredded, yeah. <laughs> so, like so for version. you. 
<laughs> for you, perhaps it, it, it took some adjusting to. For me, it was just something that was more natural. But I know for some people, it definitely takes some adjusting to. Like when, when I'm teaching seminars, I've, I've taught maybe a handful of seminars, like six of them. And I always have to start it out with some tricky things from the striking range and then close out the seminar with the clinch, like an hour of clinch. So that way they kind of get the feel. They feel like they're doing exciting things. They got a lot of a lot out of the seminar. And then we dive into the things that are kind of like the little nuances within the clinch. And that way I like buy them into it. And then the same thing happens even here in Thailand that I notice. I mean, my girlfriend herself, it seems like there are parts of the clinch that she loves. But then there are also different parts of the clinch that people just have a hard time with, especially when they're going back home and their necks are really stiff. You know, they can't move their head for the next three days. They feel like they have a bobble head and a lot of these things turn them off. So how do you fit the Muay Thai style or just teaching clinch on its own and for the general public? Oh, on top of it, whenever I create a video that has to do with clinch, it, it probably gets like... 10% of the engagement that any other post would get. Mm. Um, it's hard because in the West, there are not like superb clinch fighter examples. So I think that people don't really look to it as much. Um, it's the same thing. Like if I watch the UFC, I don't really understand jujitsu unless someone's explaining it to me. So when they go to the ground and it just looks like two fat men laying on each other, I'm like, I'm not really interested in watching this. But if you can understand the technique of what's going on and you understand the patience and the movement and the feeling that those fighters are having, it can be really engaging and really exciting. Um, so I, I think that it's partially that uh, people in the West don't have the exposure that would make them excited about clinch and they don't have the exposure to be able to train it in the way that's necessary to really learn it. Um, again, similar to jujitsu, it's feeling. So you don't get to like learn a trick in clinch and then use that trick live and have it work. Um, you really have to spend a lot of time in the water basically, like just keep swimming and you become a stronger swimmer. Uh, and people just don't have that kind of exposure to clinch training. So it's really hard to, like in one video, teach someone a trick that they can go live with uh, in their own training. But there are principles that you can give to people. You can teach them how to frame up. You can teach them what kind of body positions help them have more stability. Um, teaching people how to strike out of that range. Um, some of the best clinch technique that I've learned in uh, doing sessions for my Muay Thai library are from dudes who hate clinching. Silipatai hates clinching, so his throws are epic. Like, he's like, get the fuck off of me. And his, like, slips are really amazing. So as a clincher, taking those movements is actually really, uh, it's really interesting and it's it's really cool. So um, I think that the way you teach people is basically giving them kind of a framework and a structure and then presenting them with the opportunity to actually work within it. Like. Even with striking, you can learn a combination on the bag, but then when you go and do it live with someone who's actually trying to hit you in the face, the timing and the feeling is what you have to develop in order to make that striking have context and look good. Um, and I think it's the same with uh, clinching, but people just don't have the same time uh, in clinch to really get good at it. So in that regard, uh, I have a couple questions, but the one that really came to mind, you were talking about how it's just hard for Westerners specifically to get the type of training that's needed in order to put the miles in with clinching, become a proficient yeah. swimmer, as you uh, use for the analogy. So for people who don't have the clinch training, they don't have the type of training partners that are needed to improve in the clinch. What type of tips or advice would you give to somebody who doesn't have that type of resources or people around them where they can work the clinch? Are there certain types of solo drills they could do, or is there any type of film study that would be beneficial uh, through osmosis? Just talk a little bit about that and uh, what you would advise. Um, I think it's, it's really, really hard to do it to really get good at it without having that real context. It's the, the first time I ever fought, I'd sparred once. When you haven't had contact of being hit and then you get hit, it makes things really hard. <laughs> like the things you think you know when you haven't had that contact, uh, it's, it's difficult to be uh, proficient if you're just shadow boxing without contact all the time. It's the same 
with striking as it is with clinch. But that doesn't mean that you can't use a bag, uh, use angles, film study, this kind of stuff to understand how fighters are using um, cutting off angles or escaping or timing in order to uh, clinch against opponents who are also really good. So I try to do um, a lot of clinch technique with the bag in terms of just holding it with my forearms in order to build that kind of forearm strength. Um, so being a knee fighter or Muay Cao is a lot about endurance. You have to be really, really hard <laughs> with your body and uh, you're basically draining your opponent's battery. So a lot of the things that you're gonna work on on your own uh, when you're learning clinch or trying to get good in clinch when you don't have the kind of time in the water that I'm talking about with other uh, people who can build your skill is just having the endurance. It's like um, being a pit bull with like a good bite. <laughs> like you gotta train the pit bull's jaw or something. That's that's a lot of what Muay Cao uh, and clinch training is, is just getting your like, you're not gonna get me off of you kind of thing. I love the analogies you're using. They uh, they <laughs> help make it they help make it more uh, uh, easy to understand, and uh, especially for those who don't have that type of uh, clinch training and know what it's like to be in the shit of clinching. Like th that pit bull mm -hmm. analogy, I love. Um, I, we have a good question from someone on Facebook, uh, Shannon. She was saying, "Hi Sylvie, love your stuff and follow your Patreon. Have you ever considered fighting in IFBA? And if so, how do you think your Muay Cow style would fare if uh, with that rule set?" I am looking at fighting in IFMA. Um, it's it's a different rule set. It's slightly different rules. The international rule set um, does not disfavor clinching, but you have to strike in clinching. Um, in tie scoring, like strictly tie scoring, there's a lot of looking at dominance and like the overall story arc of a fight. Uh, in IFMA, uh, it's more like using a calculator and it's only three rounds. So you really wanna win that first round uh, so that you're not trying to play catch up, which I think a lot of Thai women have a really hard time with because here uh, you really want to win the later rounds. So they kind of sit in the early rounds. So um, as a knee fighter, you're really draining your opponent and uh, I do my best in the later rounds. So reversing that and being really aggressive and draining someone really early in the first rounds um, is something to think about for IFMA. Um, but Loma, who is now uh, being recognized in the West as an MMA fighter. She's been doing really well, uh, Loma Lukbunmi. She is unreal in the clinch. Her throws are incredible, but she tends to um, have difficulty on the scorecards in IFMA because she doesn't score before the throw. So the dominance element of tie scoring is what she does really well with, but being able to score and then have that dominance is what she needs to make adjustments for for IFMA, and that's what I would have to do as well. Can you go a little bit further into Thai scoring? Because I feel like this is something that is constantly debated, especially in the West, as the rule sets, depending on the different sanctioning bodies, the scoring is different. So a lot of people think what they know what real Thai scoring is. However, I don't really see that to be the case. Even when I'm speaking to the officials in the sanctioning bodies, when they say like, oh, it's Thai scoring. And I ask, what is Thai scoring to you? And once they explain it, it doesn't sound like anything like it. So uh, why don't you go a little bit further into that? Because I, I don't think there's anyone that has a better knowledge of that as a Westerner than yourself. Um, it's There's definitely nuance to it. And um, you'll actually see difference in how judges score uh, like in the provinces in Assan versus how they do it in central Thailand. And you'll also see slight differences between even Rajadamnern and Lumpani. Um, Lumpani really likes forward fighters. Rajadamnern allows you to go back more. Um, and then they'll, they'll score um, throwing a little bit different from each other as well. Um, but they're, they're not that different. It's one of these nuances that if you're watching it, you wouldn't really tell the difference. But as a fighter, uh, the fighters who fight between the two know the difference. And so they know how to adjust their style slightly. Um, but I think one of the biggest differences between what Westerners look at when we're looking at a fight, we love aggression. So um, the fighter who's coming forward, the fighter who's busier, the fighter who's first, like all of these things that we think of as being um, not necessarily calculated uh, scores on the card, but kind of like um, visual scores, like the one who has ring control and this kind of abstract thing. 
all of those things that I just mentioned, the inverse are what ties look at. So it's really hard for us when we're watching a fight and we're like, that person threw way more. I don't understand why they lost that fight. Is that when ties are looking at it, they're actually looking at, instead of aggression, they look at dominance. And instead of moving forward or moving backwards, they look at who's controlling uh, the movement in general. So I was trying to explain to someone who came to my gym a couple years ago uh, because they were much busier in their fight. So they actually uh, threw a whole lot more. If you catch 10 minnows and then your opponent brings home a 10 pound fish, who had a better fishing trip, right? So uh, you'll see people who are really busy and they're like tap, 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 but they're not having the effect that one single straight knee into the belly or like a kick into the middle or this kind of thing, um, having a visual effect on your opponent is much more important than on a calculator how many times you, you know, tapped your opponent or something like this. So you see that in Western boxing, amateur boxing is all about just touching and then professional boxing is about the actual impact. Um, so we do have that in the West as well. Uh, but I think that it's, um, a little bit more uh, story arc and looking at the entire fight in Thailand than it is in the West. So was recently there was a... <laughs> no, I think that was great. And it was really interesting <laughs> diving into the topic of the different stadiums and the little nuances and changes that are there. And I actually wanted to expand upon that because there was a recent documentary that came out called Lumbini. And they talked about how much the betting has an influence on the fight itself. It even included Sanchai within it. Um, just kind of talking about how the old school Muay Thai, like trickster style that he has, doesn't fare as well anymore against fighters such as Pej Chu, who they featured in the documentary where Sanchai and Pej Chu ended up having their fight. Pej Chu kind of hangs back for the first two rounds, lets Sanchai do all his tricks. And then he just smothers him in round three and four to take the victory. H have you had experience with this or is there anything that the Thai trainers talk about when it comes to fighting in these stadiums or how scoring is changing depending on the betting that's going on? Yeah, um, my main trainer at Pet Rung Rung, he was a one song Chai fighter when he was a kid. And now uh, his specialty is like raising young Thai boys to be uh, Lumpani and Rajdamner fighters. And so he was talking about how scoring has changed, but if you are in the business of Muay Thai, you have to change with the scoring. So people complain that gambling has too much of an impact on Muay Thai. That's not new. Gambling has always had a huge impact on Muay Thai, but what gamblers like has changed. And so what gamblers like now is a lot of power. Um, so powerful fighters are the ones who are winning uh, the fights and the way that influences uh, the fight itself is that referees and judges are afraid of angering the gamblers because they put money on and so they'll get all these boos if they, uh, you know, award things that gamblers are not actually really interested in seeing. So it's not like a huge corruption, which is what it often sounds like when these um, mm -hmm. fighters are talking about how gambling has too much of an influence on Muay Thai now. There has never been Muay Thai without gambling. That's, it's not new. Um, but I think that, uh, like my trainer was talking about his own son. His son Bank is like one solid muscle. He is so scary and solid and muscular. He is not a like dance around femur type fighter, but he has really good body throws. Um, he went and fought and in round four threw his opponent a bunch of times, but they didn't reward him for it. So he lost the fight despite having dominated with all these body throws. So even though Bank is amazing at body throws, if you're not gonna win a fight like that, he doesn't do body throws anymore, even though he's really good at it. You have to make adjustments because you're trying to play the game and play the sport, sports change. So that's the way my trainer looks at it, is that because it's a living art form, it's going to evolve and develop over time and it might have some kind of uh, like retro thing where people go back to really wanting um, stylistic fighters again, um, but it's it's always evolving and you just have to evolve with it. Um, complaining that they don't like the way you fight is not necessarily gonna make the sport better, yeah. 
So I want to uh, change gears a little bit and go more towards uh, what I was talking about earlier is that the fact that you set so many goals and we were both in the same coaching group. And thanks to you, I was uh, introduced to me and the Killer Instinct mm. coaching group. And a lot of the stuff that he taught me, I still implement into my day to day life. And so I'm curious, um, have you been able to com still implement the things that you've learned from that coaching course and what type of goal setting principles and philosophies uh, have you adapted either early on or have how, how has your goal setting evolved throughout time and what's it like now? Um, oh man, that's a big question. Um, I think that now I'm better at me has this really, really good, um, example that he uses. He says, if you want to build a house, you can't just go to home Depot and buy a bunch of wood. <laughs> like you have to have a plan, right? <laughs> So I don't, I don't make like plans that I'm going to do tomorrow in order to make the thing work on Friday kind of thing, which a lot of people do and they're very successful with. But for me, my brain doesn't work that way. And it's like, um, I can't handle being like too organized, but understanding when you have a really big goal, like, um, if I want to fight an IFMA, for example, I have to qualify or I have to like, um, talk to the people who I need to talk to. And it's like, it's figuring out how these things work as you break them down. Um, doing something like the summit, which requires so much planning, it's this thing that's never been done before and it's kind of impossible, but then you just find the, the pieces that absolutely have to work and be like, fuck it to the pieces that might not work. And it's like, all right, hopefully they work and maybe they don't, but like the ones that um, are like weight bearing poles, you really, really focus on those. So, um, I think that something that knee really helped me understand is that um, if your goal in life is to be well rested and comfortable, you're not going to do a whole lot. So stop complaining about like how hard something is and uh, enjoy the thrill of how hard you're pushing yourself in order to achieve these things that really trickle down and, and change your life all the time. Like it's being uncomfortable and scared. is actually a, nice place to be in. It's not comfortable, <laughs> but you get a lot out of it, which is, um, it's inspiring. And uh, I think that you reach a lot more people by taking risk than you do by, you know, kind of settling for balance or what's easier, whatever people like to say. That kind of makes me think about the type of people I love surrounding myself with now versus what I did like five, six, seven years ago, which is now more of a what some people would consider degenerates. <laughs> <laughs> I, Are you calling I just know that it? if, <laughs> no, it's just what some people would consider. I mean, they, they can even consider me that I get the question all the time. Like uh, when glory talks about the fact that I went, I was chasing a career in medicine and then I switched over when I had my fight at MSG. They're like, I see the comments below. They're like, Oh, he quit medical, you know, of, a career in the medical field to earn 500 or a thousand dollars a fight or whatever it, it may be, you know, talking in that sense. So some people may consider me a de degenerate, even though now I live more of like a free lifestyle and doing what I love. However, you know, a lot of the students that I've had and the people that I really connect with is the type of people that have been through some really, really dark shit in the past. And it's been becoming more and more of a common theme, but I think it's because one, I respect it. And two, knowing that they've been through that, I know that whatever they're going to set their sights on next is going to be a lot easier for them. And they know how to handle that type of evil and darkness and pressure that comes with things like addiction, uh, uh, things like being abused when they were younger, whether it was physically, sexually, whatever it may be. And those are the people that really have a story to tell at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like you yourself, you have a beautiful story to tell after all these challenges that you're just seeking out, as Sean said, the, the goals that you're setting for yourself that are that seem like they're nearly impossible. And again, shifting gears, you were talking about IFMA, you were talking about taking on challenges and even failing at them. I recently had a comment on my YouTube uh, channel that really interested me because it, it is something that crosses over from Thailand and the West. And he was talking about, I look at great Sanchez record. He has about 41 losses. Then I look at the great Yeltsin Klai who has 71 losses. 
Now, I see something different about how the Thais handle losses or challenging themselves than how we handle the losses in the West. We look at how few losses a Western fighter like Ronda Rousey has, and it nearly ruins them. The fans in the mm -hmm. West also lose respect for you when you lose only a few fights. I mean, when you look at how great Sanchai, Yod have become, etc., there's a discussion to be made about losses from the perspective of the fighters and the fans in the West and in Thailand. I feel like in Thailand, you grow much more with the losses. And if you just keep on winning, you have to climb up to higher competition until you lose again. Whereas in the West, fighters pad their records a lot more and then losses end their careers. Yeah. Is there something that you can just expand upon when it comes to this? Obviously, you've had your f fair share of losses as well as wins as well. Yeah, I've had some really long losing streaks, actually. <laughs> I've had like uh, six fight losing streaks that lasted almost a year and six fight losing streaks that lasted a month because I fight all the fucking time. It depends on like what my rate is, right? But I think that something that um, we struggle with in the West is this like, that the fight represents uh, too much about your abilities and who you are. Like it, it carries too much weight. You're never as good as you look when you win and you're never as bad as you look when you lose. And it also doesn't look to anyone else like it felt to you. Like we actually don't know as much from each of those things as we think we do. So you can fight an incredible fight and lose it and feel like shit simply because you lost, but it doesn't change anything about how you fought. Like you fought amazingly well, or you can fight really shitty and win the fight and feel good because you won and then not fix those things just because you have the perfume of having won. I think that in Thailand, there's a huge benefit to the fact that this is a way of life and kids are gonna have really long careers. So it's like, a, I always compare it to like American soccer. I grew up playing soccer nobody, it feels shitty to lose, but nobody like says it means something about who you are if your eight year old's team loses their soccer game on Saturday, right? So like, why does your fight mean anything about you if you win or if you lose? It's not, it's not a test about who you are. It's a test of where you are in your progress and in your process and taking that as like um, a reading for where you need to make adjustments is what allows you to have 300 fights like Sanchai with 41 losses is that those 41 losses don't really mean anything. Uh, the, the 260 wins don't mean that much either. It's just the like, what is he as a fighter as a whole? It's like you look at the whole person rather than the record. Um, and if you look at someone who people absolutely love like Ramon Decker, he lost all the time. He lost most of his fights in Thailand. Nobody thinks about it. Like they just get washed down because it doesn't fucking matter rather than like, oh, well, I guess that changes who Ramon Decker is if you actually look at his record. Like they're, they're numbers on a piece of paper. <laughs> like, what does that do? So I think that part of the problem in the West is that we have much smaller careers. Like a person with 20 fights has fought a lot. So out of 20, if you've lost eight, that seems like a much bigger deal than if you've had 300 and you lost 40 right? Like the numbers just kind of blur at that point. Mm. So I think that because the numbers are smaller, if someone loses twice, because they're only fighting once every six months, it feels like a much bigger deal. Um, it feels like a pattern rather than something that happens like every five days or something. It's like not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> so with that being said, losing is an interesting topic because like you said, it, it a lot of people attach their like self-worth to yep. themselves as a fighter and whether they win or lose. So with people who are just dipping their toes in Muay Thai or maybe are still early on in their uh, amateur careers, what do you feel like are some things that these people can do when they do lose to continue to move forward and to progress as a fighter? Because like Paul said, we see fighters like Ronda Rousey have one loss and then boom, it, their, their whole career is essentially mm. over. And uh, that happens a lot in the West. Someone loses and they attach so much to that that they're not able to move past that. So for someone who's early in their career, learning whether they've lost already or they're going to lose eventually, how would you advise them to handle something like that? Is there any specific like uh, mindset tips or just 
even like just would they, would you say get back in the gym right away, get a fight right away? I'm, I'm just curious to hear your opinion. I would say get back in the in the gym right away for sure. Um, like crawling away and hiding under your couch to feel bad about yourself has never helped anybody <laughs> ever. And I understand. Like I've I've lost a lot. I have experience in losing. I'm better at it with the more experience I get. If you've only lost twice, you don't have a lot of experience in it, right? I've lost like 45 times, 65 times I have experience in it. Um, but I think that um, one, one thing I like to remind people of, in Thai there's this expression that they use. They say in sports there are wins and losses. That's how sport works, right? A lot of people feel super bad, like they let their team down, like they sucked because they lost their fight, like all of the training that they did was like worth nothing because they didn't get the win. And I point out to them, if you have six fights on a card uh, on any given night, and that's 12 fighters, six of them went home losers. Do you think that they're all assholes? And you never talk to anyone else the way you talk to yourself. Like you would not be like, oh my God, all those people are such assholes for losing their fights, right? It's like people lose and it's not a big deal. So don't put all of that on yourself if you don't think that about everyone else. Half that card went home as losers. Like they don't suck just because they didn't win their fight. Another thing is that this is an individual sport. You get in the ring and it's really only you, but you do have a team and you do have support. So the way that you behave after you've lost, uh, Muhammad Ali, didn't lose forever. And then when he did lose, his quote was, now that I've lost, I have to do it well. So moping around and wanting people to tell you that you're awful and have this like self-flagellation about how terrible you are and you let your team down, nobody really feels that much uh, the same way that you do. Like nobody cares that much if you lose a fight. So go with what they feel, not with what you feel, <laughs> because most people are like, that's all right. Sometimes you're unlucky and you come back to the gym and you have your community and you just get back to work. And it shows that you're hungry for the sport itself and for the art itself rather than like, I have to have this glory. Otherwise, everyone else has to suffer, too. Like, kind of, I don't know. My brother's a sports psychologist and he says, flush the turd. Like, don't leave it in the toilet. Just flush it. And uh, it's crass, but I think it's a good example. Like, you just quit staring at it. <laughs> it's like, let it go, right? Doesn't help anyone. I feel like I'm <laughs> flush the turd. Flush the turd. Put it in quotes with a mountain in his background and just put something. Yeah, yeah beautiful. Instagram. Beautiful, like sunflowers and stuff. Yeah. I feel like I want to jot half of this podcast down into my journal. And like, as you were talking about losing, I was. Oh, no. Did Paul freeze for you, Sylvie? Paul froze for me also. <laughs> he looks good though. <laughs> he does. That's that's nothing new. I guess I'll <laughs> I'll continue this. So losing obviously is a, a part of the sport, but so is winning. And I, I know a lot of people who handle winning not the best way either. And they they allow <laughs> yeah, it to get to their they allow it to get to their heads and then they, they see things differently and they're just not able to uh, use it to their advantage where some fighters are able to use uh, like the whole saying goes like you learn a lot more from your losses than you win right mm -hmm. but how do you learn from your wins without getting this like egocentric uh basis around it where all your thing is like oh yeah i'm the shit like no matter what is, is there any type of advice you give so you gave great advice for how to lose well how do you win well mm -hmm. It's, I mean, it's the same thing I said before, where you're not as bad as you think you are if you lose. You're not as good as you think you are when you win. Um, I see a lot of fighters who let the judges who are outside the ring influence how they feel about how well they fought. Hey, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> so um, looking at your fight, looking at your fight the way you actually experienced it um, and how it felt and what you can get out of that it should be the same whether you won or you lost. You should be assessing the entire fight rather than just whose hand was raised at the end. Um, there's a, a wrestling podcast that uh, this dude, I think it's called Wrestling Mindset. He has a really good saying that he probably took from somewhere else, but he says whether you're winning or losing, it should look the same. And he's talking about your attitude. So if you're losing your wrestling match or you're losing your fight, don't start pouting in the ring. Don't be like, oh, I give up. If you're winning, don't start gloating and being like, oh my God, this person sucks, all this stuff. 
it's the same thing of winning and losing is whether you won your fight or you lost your fight, you should kind of have this even uh, growth mindset when you come out of it, which is there are things you could have done better and there are things you did really well. And that's true whether you won or you lost. So um, talking a lot of shit when you have won your fight or thinking that you're like the greatest ever that nobody can beat you uh, when you win your fight, if you're winning all your fights, you're not fighting the right people, honestly. So um, in the West, we get really excited about undefeated records. I find that the most boring type of fighter. Like, what is the point? <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> now, playing devil's advocate, if you're the type of person, because it's always personality dependent. At times, I've definitely been in the ring where halfway through the fight or usually begins begins in the locker room the day of the fight where I just don't feel like being there and wanting that win because at times there's also the opposite is like you know we're so scared of the loss but there are also times where some people need that oomph to make them want that win you know for them not to want to be a loser in a way right mm -hmm. so like it's kind of the complete opposite of that is like some people need the opposite what would your advice be to them i'm not sure i'm not that type so <laughs> uh, i think i think if you have to psych yourself up to fight in ways that are not about you want to fight. I don't know, like figure out what it is that you're doing. Um, Andy Thompson, who was my first mentor when I moved to Thailand, he was the owner of Lana Muay Thai and he recently just passed away. Um, you could be like bent out of shape, nervous getting in the ring, or you could be like super excited to get in the ring, or you could be like, I want to get the fuck out of here. The only thing he ever asked you was, do you want to fight? And if you were like, yes, I want to fight, he's like, get in the ring. He didn't care if you like had a hurt foot, hand, if you hadn't trained enough, if you hadn't run. If you want to fight, you're prepared to fight. That's the only preparation you need. And I feel like that's the heart that I come at it with. Um, in my losing streaks, what it taught me is that I love to fight, not that I love to win. If you only love to win, choose a different sport. If you love to fight, fight as much as you can. Paul you have experience with this where you are given these opportunities where they are not building you like Paul, can you be on this huge, can you be on this huge card against this opponent who like we're trying to fill someone with blah, blah, blah. This is not a, like, this is Paul's show. We're going to make things easy for Paul, but you're like, fuck yeah, I'm going to take that opportunity because someone's giving you a megaphone. Someone's giving you a stage. You can do what you want to do in that situation. So you can approach that with a poor me. Nobody's building me. Or you can be like, I'm the fighter and I don't need anyone to build me. Like I'll meet these opportunities because it was offered kind of thing. Which one of those people are you inspired by? The person who like their promoter is bringing them up or by the person who's like, yes, to every opportunity, whether they have advantages or not. You know, I think that people are inspired by the heart of a fighter, but then it's difficult to actually um, maintain that because people who are outside of the sport or outside of the lifestyle have judgments about it, but it really has nothing to do with you. They can talk about it over there. Like it's, it's over there. Yeah, honestly, it's an unfortunate thing because that, that is exactly where my mind is. And that's exactly what the people around me see. But then when you're talking, to, even talking to the promoters or just the general public, they're still just hyped on the highlights that you see at the end of the night and then the W and the L that they show. Because mm -hmm. let's say that specific example was the first fight that I had with Glory. And I was picking my opponent apart all three rounds, but the only thing that gets posted on Twitter or whatever else is that he won the split decision and the one strike he landed in the second round where that was the flash knockdown, right? So like, that's the only thing that, get fe that gets featured and that's what people remember. So obviously for me, it it's a piece of heart for myself within myself and the people that are around me. But unfortunately, like in the like, grand scheme of things, like it, when you have a bigger vision of, let's say becoming the champion of the organization, it doesn't help to build you, unfortunately. No, no, you gotta do all the legwork, it sucks. <laughs> Yeah, I'm uh, curious. I to um, just, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, you and me, you tell me. As uh, we were talking about the summit earlier, I just wanted to uh, touch more upon the part that you were talking about with female fighters not getting the same opportunities, especially back home in the West. But the same being here, sometimes when they come to Thailand, what are some of the biggest limitations that they face in the clinch or? I guess the questions that you get most often from uh, female Nakmoy that reach out to you. Uh, 
there are just way fewer of us in the sport in general. So in a gym, you'll have like one girl or like four girls or something. And they, they tend to match us simply because we're women, even if we're not the same skill or the same size, it's like you guys go over there because you're similar kind of thing. Um, so I think it's, it's difficult even just to get the exposure. Um, in a lot of gyms, women do get to work with the men and they're, they're part of it. I'm talking about in the West and in Thailand, it's less so. Um, but women who get to work with men all the time and then fight women, it's not necessarily the same style. It's not necessarily the same thing. Um, I'm really small. Uh, so when I train in my gym, I'm always going against bigger people. And then when I fight, my opponents outweigh me by like 15, 20, 30 pounds sometimes. The things that you can do when your opponent is that much bigger or uh, when your training partner is that much bigger, it shapes what you're able to try and what you're able to do. And so you have these like built in limitations because of who you have to train with and who you have to fight. So women being isolated in different gyms is a difficulty. Uh, one, because we're super competitive with each other rather than being like a sorority together to help each other get better. Um, and then on top of that, you just don't have the same exposure to different techniques. So here in Thailand, uh, women tend to be pocketed. So there will be gyms that have a number of girls and gyms that have no girls. Um, the gyms that have like a bunch of girls who can train together don't have exposure to the same um, technique experience that like boys and men will get because their trainers have more experience. So as an example, the Petong Pung gym up in Chiang Mai and Mei Rim, it's almost all women. They train each other, they don't really have a teacher. So I go up there and I clinch with them to like teach them some things that I've taken from my trainers or from the legends who I train with just to get it into their training system. Um, if girls are just training with each other and their level's not very high, you don't have people pulling each other up the way that you do in gyms where you have like a yodmoy and then you've got the babies and they kind of like rise to each other. So that's that's a difficulty that women face all over the world. Um, but in Thailand can be a serious difficulty because women are kind of pocketed. Um, one of the reasons I left Chiang Mai was because it's more conservative up there. So I couldn't even clinch with the boys. Um, they had a men's ring and a women's ring and all the clinching would happen in the men's ring and people didn't even notice. They'd be like, Sylvie, why don't you join us? And I'm like, cause I'm not allowed to touch it. Like I can't even touch the ring. Um, so I just didn't get the exposure. But when I moved down to Pattaya, the gym that I'm at now, there were kids. And because the boys were young, it wasn't a problem yet for them to be clinching with a woman, but they all eventually outgrow me. So I have to like wait for the next wave to come up. So it's, it's that kind of cultural limitation here and then there's limitations in the West just because you don't have uh, as much variation and exposure and things like that, um, that I don't think is impossible to solve, but it, it has so many different working parts that need to change in order to make it more equal. Um, but I think it's just gonna take a long time, but you know, things change, it's all right. <laughs> it's the evolution of the sport, that's for sure. Oh, and uh, yeah. you've done a, a, a big part of uh, helping uh, helping women feel more accepted and, and learn how to kind of find their niche inside the sport. Uh, thanks to like your forums and all the discussions that you have. And uh, I'm sure they're really thankful for that. And on, on another note with uh, the whole woman thing, I kind of wanted to start wrapping up here, but before we go uh, kind of talk about the Moy, Moy Cow summit that you have going on again, why don't you just give us another quick little synopsis of uh, what it's all about, who we can expect being there. Uh, where we can watch it live and, and all that stuff. Yeah, so um, we're starting on the 9th of December. Uh, we have 14 women coming and for the first three days we have Yod Kun Pan, the elbow hunter of 100 stitches uh, overseeing our training. Such at a cool Petro name. Rome. I need that name. Oh my God, <laughs> he's, so, he's so badass. He's so amazing and he's like small and soft spoken and then you're like, just don't get near me. It's like <laughs> so scary. <laughs> um, so he's overseeing the first three days and then we're going to have Karahat uh, come down. He's going to start uh, advising as well. He invited his buddy Nam Kabuin, who uh, is an epic, very well-rounded fighter with incredible body throws and knees. He's going to come down and help. Then we have Diesel Noy, the king of knees, Samson Hassan, uh, who has probably my husband's favorite uh, Muay Thai library session with Samson Hassan. He's got this like little tank coming through and just destroying people. Um, we have Long Sawan, who was uh, Mr. Merciless Me, 
who both Karahat and Gansok, who were fighters, uh, like epic fighters from the Golden Age, were like, I don't want to fight Long Suwan. He's exhausting. <laughs> like, he was horrible to fight. He's coming down. Uh, Diesel Noy is like just the, the king of all these people. So we have all of them coming. And then we have um, four or five uh, of the best female fighters coming in. Chomini, who just fought on Glory against Ashley Nichol. She's going to be coming in and training with us. Uh, Sao Sing, who's my super female Muay Cao crush. Um, Dark My Ba is coming in. She's uh, an elbow fighter as well. She's really nasty. She's coming straight from Macau fighting there, and then she's going to come train with us. So uh, if you watch the live feed, we're going to have a host, Janine, so she can explain what's going on. You can ask questions of her. She can be like, Diesel Noy, what are you doing? Show this. Uh, bring that in. Um, it's going to be really hard work because both Long Suwan and Diesel Noy separately uh, expressed how being a Muay Cao fighter, you cry a lot because you're on the bag doing your knees when everyone else has gone home because you just have to be so hard. Um, so it's going to be like a boot camp, super hard, uh, but it's going to be awesome. It's going to be women working together and uh, being monsters together. And at the end of it all, we're going up to Chiang Mai and having a fight night. Um, that's six or seven of us fighting. It's going to be at Tape. Paul, definitely come if you can. Um, and yes. that's going to have Long Suwan, Diesel Noy, and Karahat as like guest referee judges as well. So it's crazy. Wow. It's crazy. <laughs> it's really cool. So I'm excited. Um, I'm going to have to put the link to that because it's hard to remember, but it's uh, bit.ly join the summit is where you can sign up to get the um, live stream. We'll make sure to add that to the footnotes within iTunes, within the YouTube video and below in the Facebook video. So for anyone that wants to check out the summit, whether you're here in Thailand and some of the people that have been live on it, or you want to watch it live at home, you can do so there. I'll definitely be there in Chiang Mai when you guys are coming here to fight. That'll be super exciting. Whatever you need from me, I'll be here for it. I want to thank you for everything you do for the sport, everything that you're spreading, the inspiration that you provide for everyone through your fights, through your posts, through your videos, you know, expo especially exposing uh, the beauty of Muay Thai and a lot of these legends that yeah, Kevin talks about this a lot, that soon many of them may be forgotten. So shining a light on them for, for their name to live on, I think is a beautiful thing. So can we expect this to happen again next year? I hope so. It's a lot of work, so we'll see. But it's it's. I anticipate it being really great, and hope that we can do it again for sure. Well, I'll definitely be looking forward to that. And if it does, definitely let us know. We're super happy to have you on the podcast. As as we said the first time, you're always welcome. You know, it's an open door <laughs> policy with us, the Muay Thai guys. Anything else from you, Sean? Nah, yeah. Thanks, Sylvie, so much. And uh, I'm excited to join the live stream and watch everything that you got going on as well. And uh, yeah, I envy your hard work and be able to balance all this kind of stuff out. So uh, keep at it, girl. Thank you. <laughs> Boy, tight guys, we're out. <laughs>